View from the Gutters, episode 127. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Lumberjanes Volume 1, and to skip ahead to the recommendations section, skip to 5225. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. Uh, episode 127, <laughs> I'm Andrew Chard. I'm Joe Preddy. I'm Tobias Panjin. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. Brant Gillahan Eddy. Welcome to the show, everybody. Joe is back. I am back. back I'm back from, from the farthest reaches of the Southwest. How was your vacay? Oh, it was, it was awesome. I love going back to visit Albuquerque. I, I love my people there. And the food is really good. And... So how many flying scorpions did you see? Um, well, when you grow up there, they teach you how to catch them and ride them. So I saw many. That's not fair. And I rode them around for a while, and it was awesome. Uh, of them had unicorn horns. Uh, no, that's a myth. How did you prevent them stinging you? you they don't sting you if you know the secret. Yeah, I feel like you if just... you're riding it, you're like even closer to the stinger. <clears throat> yeah. No, no, they like tuck pre- it away. No, you're How so you close yourself... to it that it can't sting you. <laughs> I see. Ah, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> Pretty much. This would go right over you. You never see them sting themselves, do you? That's right. <laughs> Duh. Uh, How could I have been so stupid? Uh, Anyway, this week, speaking of flying scorpions, we are talking about Lumberjanes. Yes, but first. Yeah, we have announcements. Thank you to our episode sponsors, Addison Appleby, Brian May, Tony Cortero, and Brandon Hill. Yay. Yay. Hooray. Thank you, everyone. And I think that's the only announcement that we have. We read Lumberjanes. We did read Lumberjanes Volume 1. We did. Volume 1. The trade. Mm -hmm. And, Kaylee, you pitched this. I did. That's right. How do you feel about Lumberjanes? I love it. Do you like it? I like it a lot. Um, and so Lumberjanes to me is exactly, it's feminism in a comic. And it's perfect and it's great. And I love all of the characters and I love the art and I love their swears. Um, like Holy May Jemison or... Yeah, things like that. Um, everything about this uh, comic is just great. So the Joan Jet gets. Uh, it's like, what in the Joan Jet are you doing? Yeah. Um, God, I have. Like, this. Oh, oh, my Bessie Coleman. Yeah. <laughs> Where the <clears throat> Phyllis Wheatley were you? <laughs> uh, um, but one of the things I like the most about this are the characters. Um, so you have the five main girls. Um, hold on. Um, Joe, Molly, April, Ripley, and Mal. Uh, Mal. I don't mm-hmm. know why I did that. Um, I and I acceptable. love... Okay. Um, I love that each character is unique and not in a very tropish way that most people tend to do, like, individual girl characters. Mm-hmm. Like, you usually have the blonde, the brunette, and the redhead. One of them's smart, one of them's really ditzy, and one of them's, like, really tough. Um, this one, every single character has their own strengths, but they're not so polarizing that it's unbelievable. Um, and every character has their weird traits or weakness or uh, a different strength emotionally <clears throat> than maybe another character has. You have this wide spectrum of characters, all of which uh, they love each other um, and they work together to solve things because they're best friends. And I just really love that. I love that as a concept. And to me... This being pure feminism in a comic really kind of shows everything that we strive for. A, like if you're if you're a feminist, where it's you get to do what you want without fear of retaliation or people saying, "Well, you're not supposed to do that," or "Oh, that's weird that you're into that's that." It's unladylike. Yeah, or anything like that. At the same time, you have a lot of you have the um, Boy Scouts mm-hmm. who are like cooking and making tea and are very orderly and mm-hmm. stuff and um they're baking cookies yeah they're baking cookies and they're doing what they want and it's just this is great it's everybody being comfortable with who they are and what they want to do and it works it's a freedom from like pre-assigned gender roles in a lot of ways yeah um for men and women so you have the like male camp counselor which we learn more about in later issues but at the time we meet him he's just like 
what are you doing making cookies? Boys don't make cookies. They chop wood with their foreheads and yeah. do outdoor stuff. Well, and it's and like, he's such a trope that he's intended to be a joke. Yeah. Um, so. Well, he represents toxic masculinity, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah. It's the idea that masculine <clears throat> things are not inherently bad. Like going out and chopping wood, fighting bears, all that. Those, those are awesome. all, all great things yep. to do. But if you force somebody to live like that or to do these certain activities that you Mm -hmm. deem manly and they don't want to, then that's bad. Mm -hmm. Likewise, inherently feminine or feminine things are not inherently bad or inherently weaker, Mm -hmm. anything lesser than the masculine things. It's just, if you force somebody to do that and they don't want to, that's when the problem arises. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just really like that you have these characters, some of which are more traditionally girly or um, more traditionally masculine or whatever, but, they're very comfortable and mm-hmm. they all get to do what they want to do. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's kind of that ultimate fantasy dream world in which uh, everyone's free of the media <clears throat> reprogramming you into being like, those action figures are only for boys. These like kitchen toys are only for girls. Uh, you know, girls only like makeovers and this, and they don't like robotics. Um, we learn a lot more about um, April's best friend, the tall one. Oh, Joe. Joe is she was going to go to robotics camp because she's like a super smart robotics engineer, mm-hmm. and uh, she wanted to go to camp with April instead because they're best friends, and so. I also really appreciate all the different kinds of intelligence. Yeah. Uh, like every girl is a different kind of smart. There's a series of like trials that they have to go through in the early issues. And Joe is like, oh, it's a Fibonacci sequence. Like this is a really easy, like we can get through this number puzzle, like no problem. And they jump through and then they get to the next room and she's like, I don't understand. It's not this kind of code. Like I don't get it. And then, um, Molly. Uh, Molly is like, oh, it's an anagram and like solves it. And so everyone yeah. has their own unique like level. And she had literally like two pages before been like, I don't think I have any skills. Yeah, I shouldn't be here. Yeah, I shouldn't be here. And I think that that like on top of the super friendship power, which I think is really important for young girls to realize that life uh, is not a competition with other girls, that you can compliment other girls and it's not the end of the world. Uh, I like that friendship uh aspect of it but i also it's really important that intelligence is in no way frowned upon ever in the series like not just for girls but just for anyone well uh intelligence isn't frowned upon nor is just kind of brute strength and problem solving (laughs) as a skill um like ripley it will ripley or Mm -hmm. april who is the tiniest of the group beats the stone (laughs) statue with knowledge no, with in an arm wrestling. Yeah, contest. but but yeah, she she's leverage. like it's all well, about leverage. Well, yeah, but she still she karate chops a tree and makes a bridge. Uh, sure, that's fine. Anyone uh, can I'm do pre- that. I'm pretty when, sure that's when they there. know science. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's just yeah, it's it's great. They're all awesome, and the more you read the series, the more you find out about each one, and um, like the things that April loves uh, are more traditionally kind of feminine things mm-hmm. like she loves doing makeover she brought all of her clothes like she is kind of this like girly girl type person right. but she's also always the first one into action and danger every yeah. time yeah well i love how dramatic she is mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. she's just like oh my my hubris has led me to this situation uh, with the ketchup which, on her leg yeah she's leading the <laughs> raptors like oh my god and I they're just... like it was it really necessary to like ham it up that much yeah She's like, I was born for the stage. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's a great character. They, they're all fantastic characters. Yeah. Um, including, like, Jen and their camp counselor and Rosie, the or the head counselor, yeah. and the old bear woman. Well, and that's what I love, too, is oftentimes when you have oh, something that's kid-centered, uh, the adults will be more of obstacles than anything else. Mm-hmm. They have no wisdom to impart. They don't believe the kids. They mm-hmm. are bumbling idiots, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then this, that wasn't the case. It starts off kind of like that, though. I mean, Jen is definitely an obstacle to the girls early on. She's like, you are out of your bunks. You need discipline. Right. Taking you to the head counselor. Like, at first, Jen is very much but the... But she never, it's like, she never does the dismissive thing that parents will always do or that adults will do to children where they're like, oh, you're crazy. You well, she doesn't she, believe that, any of the magic or the monsters until she sees them firsthand, though. She, no, she doesn't, but she's not... She concentrates on what they've done. She's right. like, you did this yeah. wrong. Yeah. She doesn't berate them for making up stories or anything like that. She's yeah. just like, you guys are like... You know, keeping me from sleeping well, because and like, also, I worry about you. Broke you camp like rules. She doesn't yeah. not believe them because they're kids. She doesn't believe them because there's no such thing as magic. Right. Right. Like yeah. it's a very different thing. It's not like and you stupid thing, kids. You don't like, know anything. There's never the point where she sits down and is like, "You guys got to stop making up these stories, all right?" Mm-hmm. Like you guys. Yeah. There's never any of that, and that's what I yeah. hate. It's like she's very. She is very businesslike. She is very mm-hmm. much like you guys are breaking she's rules. Charge, you can't yeah. do yeah. that. But uh, she's. Well, and what I love about that, too, is, um, and I, it might be past where we read, but she ends up helping the girls um, mm-hmm. in one of their grand schemes. And right before that, she's talking to Rosie and is like, well, I just feel like I'm in the way. Like, I, I have no, mm-hmm. I have none of these girls' skills. And Rosie's like, yes, you do. Like, why do you think I made you a camp counselor? And she's like, ah, well, I don't know. And she's like, because you are, you're practical and you're very down to earth and the mm-hmm. girls need that. And I just thought that was really cool. Where it's like, mm-hmm. no, being a practical person, being somebody who is concerned about safety, being somebody who is worried about others and a, wants to make sure that things are kind of falling in line is, is a good thing. It's not always a bad thing at, right. to be a like a type A personality. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really cool. Brant, you, this was your first time reading this, right? Yeah. What, uh, what'd you think about it? Mm, I liked it. All right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's hard because it was only four issues Yeah, and its tone makes it feel very, um, I'm not trying. I can't think of the right word. I want to say niche, mm. niche. I would like to say that word, but I, not necessarily like that doesn't feel like the right word, but like it has a certain, it has a very particular, like aside from the proto feminist rah, rah girl power message, which actually feels so well deployed that I, like I noticed that and yeah. I knew that about the book, but I wasn't like, Oh, well here's how the ways in which feminism is ruling yeah. this book. Yeah. Which I mean, maybe is perhaps the most artful deployment of that kind of, mm-hmm. that kind of philosophy is, is by making it so that it's not like, um, well, you make it the norm yeah, and then it doesn't feel out of place. But, yeah. but it has a, it has like I, I said earlier before we were recording it, the art reminded me of Kate Beaton mm-hmm. from, um, Oh gosh, what's her blog called? Uh, Hark a Vagrant. Yeah, Hark yeah. a Vagrant. And even the humor, to a certain extent, mm-hmm. it felt like a, a mash between her and then some of the other stuff that we've seen Noel Stevenson do. And so it reminds me of some of the various shows that, like, you know, like I think, not not specifically in tone, but like Venture Brothers and Archer and where that has a very specific type of humor. And yeah. it's kind of one of those things where, like, you're all in or you're not. Yeah. And so I could see some people picking some being like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Like, not, not that the premise in of itself is bad. But that, like, the tone around it would make people be like, mm-hmm. I don't, like, eh, okay, they're, like, super aggro. Like, I, like, I really enjoyed it. But I could see reading it being like, okay, so tonally, this probably has some people who are just like, uh, yeah, like, yeah. I don't get it. Okay, and I need to ask this, because I've been, I've been obsessing over it since I read it. It is a, it is specifically a, um. Kella, is it Kellis who sings all my milkshake? My milkshake brings all the boys. Yeah, together. Uh, yeah. But she says yeah. I can teach you, oh, but yeah, I have no, to totally, church. It is totally. specifically meant to oh, be a Kellis reference, right? Because I, I was thinking I was think reading so, too much yeah. into it. And then the Fibonacci sequence mm-hmm. is actually, um, I think, it's actually a reference to the Golden Child. Is it really? Well, yeah, it's also kind of Indiana Jones. Uh, well, yeah, well, like there's that. two. Well, because the Golden Child specifically has the posts mm. that he has to get across and like has there's a cup a... of water. And so, like, I was just kind of like starting to become much more interested in the. Like, for me, I almost became like, yeah, feminist girl power. Are there intense number of social or yeah. uh, pop culture, culture references? Yeah, I think yeah. so. There's yeah. in, the, I think the one I just read, it's like winter. 
um, and there's like at least 15 Frozen references, Excellent. like in a row, and it's awful, but perfect, but hilarious at the yeah. same time. Like there's a tremendous amount of pop culture references yeah. in the book, and they are all intentional for sure. So it was that funny thing where like I was just kind of reading and like, yeah, okay, this is good, and then mm-hmm. and then I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, I've actually, seen some of these things before. I'm actually right there with you, Brant, in terms of I I really liked it, but less for the feminism and kind of the meta text. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for me, if this is very evocative of like juvenile and young adult fantasy, mm-hmm. like being off at camp and running into all of these magic things and having yeah. like a kind of a summertime adventure yeah, absolutely. with like monsters and magic and weird ruins and all this cool stuff. And I really got into the setting, yeah, uh, especially at the very end of the volume when you see the boy scouts and they're like boy scout, like napkin ring things are all glowing and yeah. you're like, oh, it's the eyes that the monsters all have it's the same oh my god it's all to, it all makes sense yeah. yeah and i was like i i had that very visceral moment of like dun, 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 yeah like suddenly revelatory and i got it i gotta know what happens next I'm and it, super interested the world building <clears throat> continues even after that first arc wraps up you still there's more summer to go and um, i think that's so smart just like the whole thing with the lighthouse like yeah who builds a lighthouse on a lake yeah. That makes no sense. Right. Who would mm-hmm. do that? That's so spooky and weird. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you were in Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. I was. Science Camp. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, I felt like like reading this, because I was in Girl Scouts and I went to Science Camp. Um, I also went to a Christian camp, but we don't talk about that. Um, it felt like those relationships that yeah, you absolutely. have in your cabin where like maybe you didn't know each other before or whatever but you're best friends by the end of it like mm-hmm. you very much so have this like <clears throat> oh yeah you know we're we're this cabin and like our team is the best team and we're gonna go out on crazy adventures and there's always a camp counselor that's kind of chasing after you being mm-hmm. like no wait but um it was really nice and i really felt like it was a mashup of those childhood memories and like adventure time and mm-hmm. steven universe and that sort of gravity falls yeah like that that type of cartoon which are that's what's hot right now and so <laughs> this is yeah. in right now yeah. <laughs> i mean this is um this was all my favorite parts of like uh the, of several tv shows that i really enjoy i thought it had uh there was it had that kind of air of like mystery and like spookiness that Gravity Falls has. It has like the cool action of, of Adventure Time. And, and it's Steven got, like, Universe has and all Steven that sweet Steven Universe, thing. yeah. And it's got the friendship aspect that I think is what makes MLP really good. And like, because that's my favorite part. Uh, don't fucking look. No, I'm not. At I'm me. not looking sideways <clears throat> at you for liking My Little Pony. I'm looking sideways at you for calling it MLP and not. My little, pony. My little Pony friendship is magic. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, you, um, you have oh, a thanks, because I actually excuse. didn't know what that was. I do. So you don't it, need wasn't, it. it wasn't Audrey that got me into fucking you My don't Little Pony. It was Kirby's brother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't th- I'm really hoping nobody got you into fucking My Little Pony. No, no, oh, that's God. awful. And, uh, I don't search that. Try. Everybody take a time. Right. Yeah, <laughs> let's not go there at all. Don't ever I think search that. The, the thing to me is that, as somebody that is the father to a now teenager... The, the 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 way that society tells women that they have to be in constant competition with each mm-hmm. other and they have to not like each other is something that really bugs the shit out of me. So well, any time only... I see a group of girls that are like, we're fucking friends and that's what matters and we will overcome anything because our yeah. friendship is the most important thing. I'm like... Fuck yes, this is awesome. Here, well, like again, inappropriate placement of the word "fucking" in that sentence. Oh well, my god! Whatever. I don't know. Phrasing, we, maybe we'll see. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <laughs> some things lead me to believe that some phrasing? of them may be fucking friends. Yeah, maybe. Um, um, but uh, I also think that not only in competition with girls, like this book is not only about that, but it's also about. There's definitely a concept in the social c- construct that we have that, like. You know, gir- it, oh, it's great for women to excel, right? As long as they're, they're not uh, making men feel yeah, inferior, as long as they're and not, that, which yeah, is exactly. bullshit. But or as long as they stay to like, yeah. you can be Julia Child, right? You you can be really great. You be the best chef you want, but don't be like, don't work in a restaurant. That's right. not yeah. Like 
make jello loaf, jello molds. Yeah. Yeah, which is all bullshit. But right? I love more than anything because they come back the interactions that the lumberjanes have with the um uh what are they called i forget the name of the boys um to like the something boys like uh, uh this, are they scout boys scouting boys or something i don't there's something weird um but they meet up with them again and they're just like oh hey what's going on with you guys oh i don't know what's going on it sounds like you guys are having a crazy summer it sounds like you guys are and it's just like this great mm-hmm. like camaraderie because they're all kids and they're all kind of in this together um i Which really is like thing that i really like mm-hmm. i mean i i really enjoyed this i think the that, scouting lads. Scouting, scouting lads, lads, thank that's you. That's what it is. <laughs> I think the, the cool thing to me is just that it doesn't feel... Um, it, it, the, the ideas of that I think modern feminism espouses, which is that it's pretty much be who you are yeah. and kind of do what you'd like to do. Don't, you know, it's, it's a very I mean, mellow thing. Do what you want to do in living color. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody here is equally kind. But um, that's also from the theme song. <laughs> I can remember the theme song. It's playing in my head right now. Yep. <laughs> God damn it. It's going to be in my head for the rest of the fucking night. <laughs> Was that an appropriate use of the word fuck? Yeah. God. Yeah. Always. Um, I'm, I'm feeling extra snarky tonight. Um, but okay. it is. I, I think this book sets out to do something. And I think it succeeds on every level. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't feel... Like, it's, look at these girls! They're so unique! Look at how unique yeah. they are! Right. It feels very natural, and their friendship feels very natural. It feels like the way that you can be yourself around your friends, and it feels like the kind of friendship you have that's, I think, it, it's something that's common to children, where it's before you've kind of been fucked over by the world, and you mm-hmm. trust absolutely this group of people Mm -hmm. because you know that regardless of what happens they will have your back 100 percent. one of the things i really love about this um is anytime that you have like a well-written female character there is always this moment in any book movie comic whatever and it's like the special snowflake pep talk um where it's well, I just feel like I don't fit in. And then, oh, no, you're unique. Mm -hmm. You're different. This makes you cool. There is none of that. It's we're all different. We're all cool. Just and we're just going to go with it. Like, that's the standard. There's no like there are motivational speeches mm -hmm. and like, like, no, girl, you got this or whatever. Um, But it's not it's not that special snowflake pep talk that happens over and over and over again which while building this one character up simultaneously tears the rest of the characters down or tears the rest of women down or the rest of the audience down by saying well they're not unique you you alone are special in your uniqueness Mm -hmm. and nobody else is like that it's the standard for them and they're not even like the most rambunctious cabin Honestly, if you look at the other the other cabins in the camp, they're all equally mismatched yeah. talents, types, mm-hmm. whatever. And they're all like some of them are very kind of quiet and reserved. Other ones are very rambunctious and like, whoa, we're going to go to the raccoon rodeo, you know, things like mm-hmm. that. And it's just it's almost as if women are people and have very almost as types as people. and yeah, personalities. Right. Are you sure, I don't know. It sounds pretty it's extreme. Almost it's really like weird. character pretty development radical. doesn't come from character traits. It comes from people reacting in situations. I know. Whoa. Right. I was going to say, you both brought up something that made me think of how lightly this sidestepped two things. One is Joe's talking about how they're each kind of like unique, but they're all, they're not tropey. They all have their own kind of, you know, things about them. And it's not like, you're the brainy one. You're this other one. This very easily could have fallen into that by just like having the little like nameplate and then like what they are underneath. Yes. It. Yeah. And it never oh, does God. that. It forces you to like learn about them organically yeah. through time. It's like, you don't know a lot about these characters early on. It takes several issues for you to figure out that, uh, Joe is into robotics and that April is like more likes clothes and makeovers and is like super competitive. Yeah. Like it takes you a long time to kind of learn some of these things. Well, and what's 
Oh, sorry. Oh, keep going. Oh, oh uh, what's interesting, too, is if you read, like, any sort of synopsis of this book or, um, like, different reviews and stuff, mm-hmm. it'll always say, like, oh, so-and-so, who is the brainy one? It's like, yeah. no, well, no, yeah. she isn't. Like, they, they're all smart. Yeah. Or, and- like... So and so, which is the pretty one, like, oh, okay, what? No, like this never set up in the yeah. comic. So I feel like you get a lot of reviewers and people who are so used to this trope, who are so yeah. unwilling to accept to that that characters can overlap different yeah. aspects and be similar and dissimilar equally. Right. Um, that they feel the need to categorize them. And I love reading this because you can't do that. Like well, it forces you to get it's when when you're presented with that when you open up a book and you get that that plaque and it's like this person the ugly this one. one yeah right <laughs> what's her face uh that's what i was just saying yeah. glad i was not the only one no, thinking I about thought that. that too um it it, for, it it immediately is like okay well this is this person's designation so that's right. who they are mm-hmm. when you are not given that when you are not presented with that right off the back and you're reading, you learn about the characters mm-hmm. as the author writes them. So it's the journey you're taking together yeah. and it allows you to kind of get to know them better. It allows a certain kind of intimacy with, with the characters and allows you to kind of, Play the game. You can start fucking extrapolating all kinds of shit if you mm. want, which I think is what real well written any well written fiction should yeah. do is allow you to kind of like tease things out of your uh, out of yourself and imagine scenarios in which you know these characters because they've been written so well and because they've been allowed to develop. Like you could appreciate what they do, right? This right. Is like the yeah. Whole... This to me, this comic is the perfect example of. Strong female versus uh, st- strong female character versus well written female mm-hmm. character, where you have so many people who've been clamoring for strong female character for so long that the the trope of that is basically like Miss Man, right? Yeah, the, uh, the man in a dress. Yeah, and so you have now everybody's kind of like, well, let's let's stop saying that and let's say well written female yeah. character. And a lot of ways, I was reading this really cool article about it. Where they're saying we should we should not call them strong female characters. We should call them well written female characters because that proves to writers just how low the bar is, yeah. and that they're failing to meet that. We don't necessarily need a, a like a woman to come in punching and kicking and fighting. We need a character who has traits, who is a character, who is mm-hmm. a fully fleshed out thought. Well, we and, need you to, yeah, we need you to take more than five seconds to think about this character. Yeah, because yeah. it's. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was uh, just going to say, so all of these characters to me fulfill that standard of well-written female mm-hmm. character. I mean, it helps to have two <clears throat> ladies writing the book. It's an all-female. It's an all-female uh, team, yeah. but the writers are both women. Yeah. And I think that makes a difference in, um, I will go out on the limb and say this, that uh, it's often been said, but I agree that um, female writers are better at writing male characters than male writers are at writing female characters. And I think that that just comes from the fact that a lot of female writers are railing against the, the system, the patriarchy and saying like, this isn't how things are like these tropes. That's not real. You've made it this way. You've, you're trying to force square pegs into round holes. So not only can I write, female characters with interesting motivations that means i'm writing people which allows me to write any person yeah, yeah I mean, and I, I think george r. r martin says it best when people are like oh i've noticed you're really good at writing female and, characters like what well, how do you do that and he's like well i noticed that women are people too yeah i've got this it's basically idea. just like fuck you yeah. um, i think i mean rucka's answer to that because it's it's always this like people act that you're like it's like oh you wrote a really interesting character that was female. You must be a fucking wizard. Do you sacrifice a goat before the full moon and then dance to Baal? Always. It's like, uh, no, sure, I think about my do. characters. <laughs> That's my characters really are not like, yeah, right? It's just, I just do that because I enjoy <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. It's it's something I was complaining about to my brother the other day because you get the, it's it's lazy writing. Mm-hmm. It's like why I understand putting like a character in your book that's a cardboard cutout for like so that you can play with a trope or kind of play with an idea or something. But 
why would you not put a character in your story that you that like why why would you not think about that character and what would they do like why would you just kind of be like well we can just do this or we can mm-hmm. just put this character in there because it happens with villains all the time too you get these mm-hmm. really uninteresting villains oh, yeah. that are just like um preacher was a good example of this the reason we knew that jody was bad is because he used uh he was a racist Mm-hmm. He threw the N word around, right? Yeah, and that's like the the marquee, right? You knew mm-hmm. that he was a bad guy because he was a a pedophile and he was into doing all kinds of crazy sex shit, right? It's like Skyfall, right? It's like it's a boring, shitty villain. Um, I, it's, I only saw it once for a while ago. I, I, but I mean that kind of thing, He's right? Like, I'm it's, mad at mom. Yeah, it's lazy Wreck stuff. It's that's not that's not good writing. There's Come no on. characterization to the villain. And that's what I, I I that just upsets me. It's like why would you put a character in your story that you weren't going to characterize? Mm-hmm. Because you need a fucking plot device, because you need a vehicle from get to get from A to B. Like, think about it. Sometimes. Well, and that's well, fine if that's the character's only motivation. We talked about this with uh Warren Ellis has this problem. Where the ineffectual villain, and I think that that is a shitty way to show that the, your hero is very well accomplished because literally anyone could have beaten that villain. Sure. And I think that's a problem. I think if you want to show how cool your hero is, you have to first show me how terrible or well, awesome your villain is. So, I mean, there's there's a few different things that I, that I kind of want to hook onto and just play my ever persistent mediating role that my coworker Lindsay gets infuriated at me for, which is that sometimes I think it's fair and I think even intentional and okay that characters are not well characterized. Depth is, is something that can be very well used. It also is something that can distract if that's not your point. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I think about some, uh, a style of, of, story that i think many of us who are at least in the current group like which is you know there are uh pot boiler detective novels that have great characterization there are also pot boiler detective novels that don't have great characterization but are still great pot boiler detective stories well yeah like because it's about because in some ways yeah you are like and this is that something that can get lobbied lobbed at uh, superhero comics a lot too, right? Like sometimes you don't need to do all that backfilling because you are specifically relying on a trope or a mythic context or or a, an archetype to do some of that backfilling for you. And also because that's not actually the pri- priority. Right. Like I actually like the villain in Skyfall because I think the entire point of him is not really to worry about what his mommy complex is specifically, mm-hmm. but to actually project his mommy complex onto Bond and for Bond to approach his mommy complex, which he clearly has mm-hmm. and is having to grapple with. Now, maybe that worked better for me than for you, and that's fine. But like, I don't necessarily think that they needed to do more to contextualize who he was. I think that movie gets a free pass because it's like, let's put the Bond car in, let's make him a man, let's put Q in it. They're done. It's a Bond movie. Like yeah. that is not it doesn't give I you a free it. pass. Well, I, I remember enjoying it, but like it's, it's, it's not good. I think over. I think you're right. I we, think can dis- we can agree to disagree. Not not with Chard now. No, no. <laughs> I can. You see, you see. This is the thing is that I can literally say that and then not say things like not with Chard. Blah, blah, blah. I can no, be like, but eh. my job is to antagonize, right. not to well, fucking play nicey nicey. I'm I'm going to do a role that I never do, Mister Panchin. Yes, you, you've been quiet. I have. <laughs> oh, God. I I don't feel that this conversation necessarily needed my overt participation. I feel that you've all been doing a very good job. Good job of doing it yourself. Well, uh, I want to. No, I, but there there is one thing that I wanted to bring up since I the spotlight to, is on me. So uh, show, Joe, you can <laughs> shut the fuck up. You're silencing the voices totally interrupted of me and then passed the ball to you, and I didn't get to say what I wanted to say. But you know what? If it's you, okay. If you had a thought to finish, go ahead and. Finish. I do. I do because I want to agree with something Brand said, which is I agree that overcharacterization sometimes can stall out the plot and I think it does have to do with motivation what I'm saying is that I think all too often when you're trying to tell an intense story and you really want to have an impactful villain and then you have him do things like oh well bad guys what do bad guys do they use racial slurs or they they rape or you know they beat up kids or they fucking kick puppy it's like all right, I understand what you're trying to do but think about this a little bit more. You want this guy to hit me in my fucking chest. You want him, You want me to fucking have feels. So think about it. Like, 
I am, so yeah, definitely sometimes you just need the I mean, vehicle to get the It's the easy way out to like, just be like, oh, show yeah. one scene where yeah, a villain where throws a puppy in a microwave an like, and you're like, there, he's a villain. That's yeah, it. Yeah, well, done. Like, uh, G.I. Joe, very famously, I think in issue 100, brought back Cobra Commander, who had been presumed dead for years. Yeah. And like on his second page, he literally kicks a puppy. It's yeah. just an entire full page <laughs> yeah, like, like, of him kicking a puppy. And, and you're like, that's Cobra Commander. That's yeah. all I need to know about him. He is evil as shit and if you want your villain to be at the level of cobra commander then yeah yeah have been thrown yeah. around I, the I, I, and... I agree with brant that sometimes that's all you need and yeah. i agree with you joseph that sometimes you want you know, more yeah yeah you want a little bit more and yeah. one of the things i really appreciate about this book is the way in which characterization is shown not told mm-hmm. yes you understand about the characters by seeing them in action the fact that mal and molly are always in the background standing next to each other they have their arms across each other's shoulders. They're holding hands. They're always acting in ways that show that they really care about one another. And I haven't read as far as Kaylee and Chart have, but to my eye, there's a very strong implication that the two of them may m- be more than just friends. Yes. Uh, they're good friends. They are. And, um, but maybe yeah. they're just like really super good friends. Mm. <laughs> nope. They kiss. Nope. They're, All right. Awesome. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> there's, a, there's a definitely that trope of like uh, gal pals. Yeah. Where people are like, oh, these are this absolutely overt couple that is definitely in love and it they love each other. And yeah. there they are boning. Uh, they're just gal pals. They're just no, gal pals. They, oh my God, that happens to Kristen Stewart every time she's in tabloids. It's yeah. her, her and her uh, girlfriend, yeah. whose name I'm blanking on right now. They're like, Kristen Stewart with gal pal. And yeah. it's like they're holding hands. Well, what's the World Cup? The famous World Cup photo oh, from the yeah, Women's World Cup yeah, where she's, she's kissing she's her kissing wife. Her, partner, her yeah. wife. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> uh, this person celebrates with a friend. And you're like, what? This no, is not, not, not accurate. Even, no, it doesn't even say friend. It says with a fan. <laughs> with a fan. So there's no relationship there. And it's like, <laughs> just come on. Just she celebrates just, with a fan by kissing these, her passionately on the mouth and then going home to the place where they both live. They just <laughs> it's, let these women love each other. It's kind is of a no-win situation because I think that it's unfair to characterize any close female relationship as like oh they're totally boning but on the the other hand like you don't want to do that erasure thing and go like these two people who are obviously in a relationship like there's nothing going they're just good friends right the whole uh thing that happened with Korra and asami throughout the last season of the legend of Korra, Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. there was a very vocal piece of the fan base that was like no they're just good friends right (laughs) <laughs> Even yeah. into the end where they literally like disappear into a glow cloud while staring lovingly into each other's eyes. Um, I'm not <clears throat> butthurt about that at all. Mm-hmm. Um, not the fact that it happened, just the the, the haters. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really like the fact that the relationships between these characters and their characterizations are built slowly through like actually showing like the things that they do, not just telling you like, oh, yeah, they're this thing. Mm-hmm. It it works really yeah, well, and it takes you a while to kind of learn about those two characters. But they do they have their own side adventure later, where it's just the two of them and the bear woman, and it's those are some of my favorite issues. I think it's like a two or three issue arc, and um, the other girls are hanging out together trying to get merit badges or special badges or whatever. And I think it's that story arc is really important for a bunch of different reasons. I don't want to go too much into it because people didn't read it. But one of the things I think is really important in that is the non-jealousy of friends liking certain friends more than they like you. Of just like, hey, those people are going to go hang out together because they're very close. And like, I'm okay hanging out with my other friends because like, I'm still friends with them and I'm not going to get jealous that like, they have a different kind of relationship that they do. I like how inclusive this book is because you learn later that Joe and April have been best friends since they were like real, real young, but it doesn't feel like it while you're reading the book because they are friends with all of these girls equally. Like they took Ripley in and they were like, you're going to be our friend. And Ripley's the one that's on that little adventure trying to get merit badges with them and she never feels like a third wheel and i think that all of that like inclusiveness of these different subgroups within the single group of girls is an important part of the story too because everybody has a different relationship with everybody else that's yeah. just how it goes sometimes you are just closer to some of your friends but it doesn't yeah, mean you like your other friends well, less and it doesn't and... disvalue any sort of relationship right. either like just just because um uh, 
Mal and Molly are mm-hmm. a couple doesn't mean that their friendships mean any less. Right. And like Ripley being, I think she's younger than everybody. Or she seems she, like it. Yeah. Um, she's not treated that way. And she has a, a different and unique relationship with everybody else. Yeah. Like her and Mal don't really interact too much that you see, but they have their fastball, fastball special. special. And, you know, it's like, that's clearly something that they like played around with and that they did. And that you can see that as their friendship. Um, yeah, you guys. <laughs> Why is Joe shaking his head? I'm because... drawing Brand yawned and I looked at him and I was like, oh, I'm going to yawn. But then I overthought it. So I don't think I am going to yawn right now. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Behind the like, scenes. Yeah. Ooh, exclusive <laughs> first look. Uh, uh, well, this... it, it's interesting to read this the week after we read Nimona, which is also mm-hmm. by Stevenson. And, of course, the waters are muddied a little bit because she's working on this with a co-writer. But I, I think that there is a, a a line that you can see between these two works and the way that she demonstrates characters mm-hmm. and, like, really, like, gets you in into them and invested in them in the way that she demonstrates their characterization. Yeah. And it's something that's very difficult to do, and I think that she does a good job of making it look easy. Well, I think there are a few basic rules that you need to follow to do that. I'm not saying it is easy, but I think there are things that make it easier. And following a couple rules as the, like, show me, don't tell me, don't put the placard next to someone's name and go, the brainy one. Like, right. show me why they're smart. Right. Like, mm-hmm. teach me about the characters. Um, I think is really important. I think it's something she does really well in both works. Um, it takes you a while to figure out what's going on in both Demona and this work because she doesn't just outright tell you anything. Um, I think that's important. Yeah, she's also been writing Runaways yeah. at Marvel, mm-hmm. and that's been really good. And it has that same kind of gro- mm-hmm. like really interesting group dynamic where you yeah. have a lot of different characters, all of whom have strong personalities who are interacting with one another in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. So, I don't know. I think this series is really important for a bunch of different reasons. Yeah. I guess I can say congratulations on the Eisner to the team. Yeah. 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 Yes, which is Good great. Uh, two Eisners. Yeah. Yep. And uh, best single issue. I no, think. I think it's um, outstanding new series and best series for teens 13 to 17. Yeah. Uh, and I was going to say they I were think, nominated for best single issue. I think this is a fantastic uh, teen book. Yeah. And I would yeah. absolutely hand this to every teen. Oh, I'm going to force Audrey to read it. Yeah. At uh, gunpoint. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to get her. There um, is a really fantastic issue, uh, like a single issue, which is probably the one that they're nominated for. Uh, I don't remember what it is right now, but it's like a one. Oh, it's like a ghost stories, like one shot where each girl tells a different ghost story. And then Jen keeps trying to tell ghost stories, but they're not funny or they're not scary. And they're like, Jen, stop. <laughs> and that is a great issue. I, it's, it's funny that we read this because coming back from Albuquerque, I grew up in Albuquerque and the people I went to see, I've known since I was 18. So that's a very long time ago. Uh, and hundreds of years, even hundreds. Of, yes. It's well, it's, and it's a, it's an interesting thing because they are the only people I have from this portion of my life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's funny because I realized, uh, aside from their husbands, who I'm also close to, they're all women. Mm-hmm. But um, there's when we first met, it was at this underage club in Albuquerque, and we would go every Thursday and we would dance, and that was like our special time. When like no matter what else was going on, that was our time to just like blow off steam, and we would stay up to like five or six in the morning. And it was awesome. It was like this, even though kind of I look back and like, I didn't really like who I was as a person then. And my life was not very good. I had no money. Like, you know, I lived in a house with eight other people and a bunch of bad shit happened around that time. But like, those nights were awesome. Mm -hmm. And like reading this and seeing this was kind of, it was nice to kind of have that in relation to like, these memories I have of these people that have stuck with me for so long mm-hmm. and who it's, it's awesome to kind of go back and like, I think it was the Monday before I left where everybody came over to the place where I was staying and it was just, you fall back into it. It's mm-hmm. like no time has passed at all. And just that's so, it's such a rare thing when I look at like the people I'm close to now still, and I'm sure like that, that you know, that's always the case. Right. But I just, I love, and I think that's 
above like the feminism because you know you guys i'm a huge big old feminist guy and everything else that's the thing that really gets me is i love i love the friendship in this book because mm-hmm. i think it's awesome and i think that friendship is is such a power it's right thing. on the sign as you go into the camp it's like lumberjanes camp for hardcore lady types and then it says like friendship um oh, okay. it's like super awesome friendship or something like no, that it's like a, uh what's her face says it too. yeah it's when like, they yeah it's hold on we're gonna stall until toby gets to the the, the panel it's the uh Camp for hardcore lady types, yeah. and then underneath that it says friendship to the max. Yes. Friendship to the max. Friendship to the max. So, yeah, and it's such a huge part of this book. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's awesome. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, friendship is beautiful, motherfuckers. I'm also really excited because I guess one of the things that I could say that I think detracts from the book is that it is, um, it's written in such a way that. It, it it you have to kind of imagine the timing with a lot of the comedy and the action um with the way that it's written and drawn is in a sequential art style i think some of the jokes and um situations are a little tough for sequential art i'm very excited for this to be animated at some point because i think they it's in the works my understanding so i looked at i thought that there was going to be an animated feature film Mm -hmm. but i just pulled up the wikipedia entry and it says that 20th century fox is working on a live action adaptation oh that's it doesn't specify tv show or movie Hmm. or what i kind of wish this were going to be animated because i it feels like a really good pilot for an animated show I'm, i'm glad that it's not if only because it means that chris summer can't be a voice actor on it why? Because I he has a irrational for hatred for Cree Summer. She's in everything. That oh, whatever. That's most voice acting. The voice acting community is seriously like yeah, 25 it is, people. Yeah, it but is she like only 12. has two legit voices. Yeah, but those well, two so legit a voices lot of are... Them. Nolan voice. North, does he have another voice besides no, Nolan North's voice? Doesn't. No. And he's in like 42 games. He's 40 yeah, and trillion he games. <laughs> what? He shouldn't be. Well, I don't know. Fucking become a casting director. I, just, I got very tired of Cree Summer being I, in everything. What is, who is that? She was Penny on Inspector Gadget. She's, she was number five on The Kids Next Door. She was number five and her older sister. And her she older was sister. Susie Carmichael. She was Susie yeah, on Susie Rugrats. Susie on Rugrats. If you heard her voice, you'd just know immediately. Just look at her oh, IMDb page. It's like stuff? 200. She's Elmira from uh, Animaniacs. Does she still or do from stuff? Tiny yeah. Tunes. Yeah. She's yeah. still working. She, mm-hmm. Her... IMDb is like 200 entries long. I just want this to be an animated show so that we can get um, Kristen Shaw and Maria Bamford on the same show together. Oh, God. Um, two of the best lady voice actors. I want it to be animated uh, so there can be a Well, crossover they have been. They've both been voice Falls. actors on Adventure Time, just not at yeah, the same time. Yeah, yeah. I want them to be leads in a show Because Maria together. Bamford is totally hot dog princess. Well, Maria Bamford is, is like a amazing. thousand voices on Adventure Time. Yeah. She's always credited as additional voices because she does like 20 a show. Because um, she has so many voices and is awesome. And I love her. I'm <laughs> thinking of her stand-up where she does the Baby Jesus voice. <laughs> the Baby Jesus answering machines. Oh, uh, God. I love her so much. Uh. The Maria Bamford show that she made by herself like with a cell phone camera is the best show ever made nice i will fight you it's so good she plays every character <laughs> oh my god it's so good go watch it it's on our website um but yeah i, I kind of wish this was animated because i love the design yeah like, i think all the character designs and the camp design and the way everybody looks is so cool yeah we've kind of skipped over it but i really did dig on the art yeah it's a little rough but it's i like it it's good I feel like Stevenson must have done the initial character designs because mm. they're very reminiscent of her style. Yeah, I and they look no a idea. lot sharper on the covers that she did. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I did still like the main artist whose name escapes me at this it particular is second. Uh, Brooke Allen. Brooke mm-hmm. Allen, yes. Um, whoever was coloring it though must have run out of green crayons like crazy. <laughs> That's uh, not how that works. But Marcelino. Sure. Um, yeah, the, it changes artists a couple times in the series. Yes. Uh, this original art I really like. It just feels a little bit less polished. 
than it becomes later. And then I think that that's like fairly indicative of budget and time. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's also, I, I don't even know what to call it. It's definitely like a Tumblr style of art. Um, it reminds me a lot of web comics. Like, I mean, Brant said Hark a Vagrant, and it's it's totally reminiscent of that. I'm, yeah, I'm just I'm a huge fan of too. But yeah, and it's it's the style that you see like you know big artists do like Noel Stevenson mm-hmm. and Kate Be- Beaton, um, but you also see like smaller artists do like mm-hmm. I have friends who go up uh, who go to art school in Seattle and they do an art style very similar mm-hmm. to this. And it's all these like Tumblr web comics that kind of fall in line with this like cartoony kind of cute style. The characters are a little bit chubbier usually. Yeah, they're more fleshed out in certain ways, but they're also a lot simpler in others. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think art in general, at least for specific genres, is really moving towards that. Yeah, for sure. It, I see it a lot as a reaction to stuff like Gravity Falls and Adventure Time, which both have more of an exaggerated it, um, look. It reminded me of Girls with Slingshots by Danielle Corsetto. Mm. Or um, I think it's Octopus Pie by Meredith Gran, so, which is a little bit more towards the Scott Pilgrim end of mm-hmm. things. Um, but there's some definite similarities. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. There's something about the exaggerated features and like the it's, heads are it's the rubber little, band arms yeah it's mm-hmm. definitely the spaghetti arms and the their heads always seem a little bit bigger so yeah you can get more like expression well, they, they, well, they, they have a very a very thing to begin with yeah, yeah it's that it's that silhouette it's mm-hmm. if you put each of the characters in silhouette you could still tell them apart yeah having a distinctively shaped head is towards that yeah and it also helps for you to fit all the facial features in and get a lot of expressions out like if the head's bigger then you know you can they're more expressive more face yeah and that's just like an old school animation and cartoonist's trick it's just like it it just works better so that's why calvin has a fucking monstrous head indeed Mm -hmm. and it looks great and i love it (laughs) barry ween giant head yeah just huge. True. Quite mammoth. Nice. That's true. Yeah. So, are we are we good on Lumberjanes? I'm good. Yep. Yeah. Pick it up. Yeah, check it out. Give it's it to a teen in your life. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. If you know young people, put this book in their hands. Lock yep. them in their room. Take out all the furniture. Mm-hmm. I don't have all the Hold furniture. On, How about all of the electronics mm-hmm. and all of the media? Uh, just put it on their media. Beam it. That's how this works, right? That's how technology works. You beam it. Yeah. Yeah. Just no more beaming. It's called the S beam. Beam it straight from the. That sounds like my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to move on to Rex. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, do you want to start? Joe, I'll, I'll go first. I'll go, go first. I'm, I have a redemption pick. Uh oh. Because I just picked up the second volume. I'm gonna pitch Federal Bureau of Physics again. Ooh. Uh, Volumes one and two. Yeah, I think I think three just came out, didn't okay. it? Sure. So I one, don't know. One, My two, and three. fucking phone is uh, you you thinking up over there? You know what, I, what was it? I, I Federal guess. Bureau of Physics. Oh, okay. um, FBP. FBP man, uh, which uh, is basically uh, it's about a government agency that is formed to regulate. Or keep an eye on the laws of physics, which have drastically changed. In the yeah, world. what if they were not constant? Yeah, basically, it's very or weird, unchanging, very weird stuff. Um, it is one of the most strikingly illustrated and colored books I've yeah. seen that's coming out right now. Uh, Vertigo is putting it out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's well written. Yes, uh, volume three is out. So yeah, let's do the first three volumes. I've only read the first two, but they're both excellent. The first one has to do with uh, kind of. The introductory story and uh, mm-hmm. kind of a sets up the plot. And the second one is about a small town in Alaska where physics don't. There's a canyon where things will disappear and maybe come back out again, or maybe not. Yeah. Um, it's really well written. It's really well thought out. It's a book that, uh, were it not as well executed as it is, could have really fallen flat. 
mm-hmm. but I think a lot of thought is given to it, and it's a feast for the eyes. I think it's an absolutely beautiful book. It's, it's a, super saturated. It's yeah. important to note too that this is mainly a character story. It really, really is. Like the, that's the, the setting, but and the story is about the yeah, characters. It's awesome. I just, I really, really find myself liking it. I think it's it's striking in many different ways. I really like the characters and mm-hmm. and, and what they're doing with them. Um, I really like the character designs. Mm -hmm. It's just something that I, I really like everything about. So I wanted to bring it back. Yeah. Brant. So, um, I've been watching Sons of Anarchy a lot. (laughs) And so that combined with the news that Punisher will be... a book about a stolen baby. (laughs) No, it's not. Um, but that combined with the uh, announcement that Punisher will be in Daredevil Ooh, season two yeah. has led me to be uh, interested in celebrating all things gritty and crime related. So I'm pitching Punisher Max <clears throat> volumes Bullseye and Frank, which were written by Jason Aaron, illustrated by Steve Dillon. Bullseye is about a down and out, knock down, drag out fight between Bullseye and Punisher. And then Frank is about what happens after that. And actually I've seen Frank in particular um, put on quite a few lists as like one of the top Punisher stories of all time. It's gotten a lot of accolade um, in the last few years. Not with that intro. I thought you were going to pitch a Jason Aaron book, but not that one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, and then of course, Bullseye just kind of helped set the stage for Frank. So I thought it'd be worth reading that one just to kind of lead into it. And uh, yeah. So Punisher, bang, bang, gritty crime. Cool. Kaylee? Um, I am going to pitch a redemption pick. No more uh, Captain Marvel. Are you sure? Yeah. Are, are you really yeah. sure? I, I'm done. I think I can bring it back. <laughs> nope. Um, I'm going to pitch Atomic Robo. Oh. Um, by uh, Brian Clevenger and Scott Wegner. Yeah. Um, follows a robot, which I love robots, um, and his adventures through time after he was invented by Nikola Tesla. And mm-hmm. he is the head of an organization that stops weird stuff from happening. And Brent has pitched this several times. <laughs> and yeah. because he's pitched it several times, I actually started reading it. And it's great. And I feel really guilty for all the times I did not vote for it. So the several times that I pitched it count for nothing. Yeah, no, they counts for say, absolutely it's been, nothing. It's probably Who been pitched are... as a redemption pick uh, I, I, as much, if not more, than any other. I yeah. think it actually say. might hold the record. Um, yeah. You all left out the most important part of the book. Though, Which when it, well, you I'm pitch- still getting to oh, okay, I was, go getting, ahead. I, was no, go ahead. I got interrupted. I'll make sure that you there get to it. There is Dr. Dinosaur. And That's you don't really need to what know. What? That's not what I was talking about, but oh. okay, we're fine. Okay, well, Carl I don't Sagan? know what is more important than. He's a, a robot and he wears clothes. <laughs> that's great that's not the most that important that is so part. important it's adorable uh, it's the best thing that robots can do besides have a rocket fist is wear clothes you heard it here folks yep this is you the heard list. it here the <laughs> list of things that robots can do maybe that I are should important. pitch Dave now he wears rocket a tie. fist clothes Dave is awesome Dave is awesome they wear clothes in that so I'm of. not gonna pitch that this week it's good did you have anything you wanted uh, to say about sorry, Atomic I Robo? It's Dr. All, Dinosaur. Dr. Dinosaur is very important because he's a doctor and he's a dinosaur. Yes. And you don't really need to know much else he's, about him. He's not he a those doctor. Things. He is a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and Water. he traveled through time, obviously. Obviously using crystals. That's and my palm pitch. fronds. Yes, we know. My favorite comic moment ever involves Dr. Dinosaur. God, like, I hope so. It's like a six-panel layout where he's got Robo. This is not really a spoiler, but he's got Robo trapped in the. Ma- I can't remember. If it's like a magnet or a force field or whatever, mm-hmm. and then he just like flips the switch and a-, a light comes on, and he just has this look <laughs> on his face like, eh, eh. <laughs> it's, it's like an anti-gravity device, and Atomic right. Robo is talking about like how ridiculous it is. Like, why is it even glowing? That's and he's right. like, well, it doesn't have to glow. I just thought it was cool. The That's glowing right. is immaterial to the anti-gravity yeah. effect. That's right. And he's like, look, and he like switches it on and off. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. With the, but the just the way that they draw his face and yeah. the oh couple panels, he's just like, perfect. Hey, hey, isn't that cool? It's like, yeah. uh, I wish I was a supervillain who could waste uh, that and, much time. And his smirk, Doctor yeah. Dinosaur smirks a lot, and it's perfect. Yeah, I think the Savage Sword of Dino- Doctor Dinosaur might be my favorite volume of that sh- uh, that series. Good, 
Uh, but it went up as a free to read web comic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, earlier this year. So are they still collecting it? Yeah. Just, yes. Uh, and I think it's actually coming back into print again. Is it still being published through Big Red Five? No, it's not being published from through Red Five anymore. Or Red Five. Somebody else. So yeah, it's been, bu- been going through I, this weird transition. Yeah, I don't remember. But it went up on the web earlier this year, and I believe it should still be up there. I don't even remember what number it got up to. I think it was like seven or nine I volumes. Think it might yeah, yeah, yeah. ten. Yeah, was it nine? Yeah, it was quite okay, a few. Yeah. They managed to get it up there. Yeah, it was. It was far. But how many volumes are we reading, Kenny? Uh, let's do the first two. All three. ten. First Yay. three. Got to do right. the first three. All right, first three. Because that gets in the Carl Sagan stuff. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. Can I, can I do my thing? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to pitch a book I've actually been waiting to pitch for quite a number of months. Uh, I'm pitching Supreme Blue Rose yeah. by Warren Ellis and uh, was it Tula Lote? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Tula Lote. And this is a relaunch of Supreme, the <clears throat> Rob Liefeld Superman ripoff character. Uh, and it's this story is being told from the perspective of... The not Lois Lane. Mm. Basically, it's a Lois Lane like yeah. character who is hired by a Lex Luthor like character to investigate what happened to Superman, mm-hmm. essentially, like who has who disappeared. Was it? And it starts getting into <clears throat> all the weird supremacy stuff that uh, Alan Moore was doing yep. and the fact that the universe has been like rebooted a whole shit ton of times. Yeah, this is not a reboot. It's a continuation. Yes, it is Supreme. a continuation. And it's it's weird. The art is kind of off putting for like the first 10 pages. And then you're like, this is amazing. Why has no one made comics like this before? That's reminiscent of like, uh, art on low. I think. Yeah, Um, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, it's a great, brilliant series. As you know, I, I love Warren Ellis. I love the art in this. Mm -hmm. It's really good. And it's a fun time, especially if you have any interest in Superman and Superman knockoffs. How many issues are out now? Seven. I feel like nine and I'm, I'm looking at the Amazon page for the trade and it doesn't say how many issues are in the trade, but But the trade's out now. I'm pitching the first trade, which according to Amazon comes out tomorrow from when we're recording this and last week from when you're listening to it. Okay. So it'll be out. You can get it. Cool. 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 And I've just been waiting for that to happen to pitch it. Sweet. Uh, well I was going back through my list of image stuff to pitch and I thought I had pitched this already, but according to the reading list, I have not. So I'm p- hoping I haven't pitched it already. Well, um, I haven't updated the reading list in about six episodes. But it, I haven't recommended it recently because okay, it then. would have been when the trade came out because the second trade is almost, the second arc is almost done now. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm excited. And then I realized I don't think I had pitched the first one. Um, so this is a sci-fi book called uh, Roche Limit. A Rocha limit, depending on how, how people say it. It's I've heard harsh. it both both from scientists. So weird. I but no, you have not pitched this. Okay, cool. So it is um, the the pitch from the images website is our destiny is in the stars, and I will lead us there. Twenty years after this promise, billionaire Langford Scarguards. <clears throat> dream of cosmic exploration is no more rocha limit a colony situated on the cusp of a mysterious energy anomaly is a melting pot of crime and terrible secrets when becca hudson goes missing the search to find her will plunge her sister and a cadre of the colony's underworld figures into an odyssey that reveals a grim future for mankind and this is rocha limit volume one which is one through five and then at six they started over with like rocha limit subtitle number one um sci-fi is crime it's like some crazy uh astrophysics thrown in because roche limit is a real Mm -hmm. uh phenomenon um doesn't have to do with black holes yeah it has to do with like energy the transfer of energy in space or something yeah or something something to do with like gravity wells yeah like how far the roche limit is like it's a limit of like how far you are away from a thing before something happens i don't exactly understand how it works i'm not an astrophysicist you can look it up it's very interesting i remember watching a couple videos on it and going oh okay cool and then forgetting everything um but it's a it's a good it's like crime sci-fi and astrophysics all blended together really interestingly so when you pass the roche limit that's when tidal forces will actually rip you apart like falling into a gravity well cool 
Um, and so, yeah, it's a really fun book. And when I finished it, I was like, oh, whoa, I need to go back and reread the beginning again because it's kind of one of those series where once you've learned what you need to learn, it changes things you thought you knew. And I really like that narrative style. So, Is it self-contained? Yeah. The, the first I mean, it is, it is a story arc, and then the next one is a new story arc, which has some of the same characters in it, as far as I know. I haven't read the second arc yet. But it does, it does conclude the initial story. Cool. And it's very fun. So check it out. It's also it's 10 bucks because it's a volume one. So. Nice. So, Joe, what would you like to read? I think, oh man, I guess Roche Limit. All right. Brantley? Superman and Warren Ellis. Supreme, um, Supreme Blue Rose? Uh, well, sorry, but then there's that whole Atomic Robo thing, which there I've, been, that I've been desperate, thing. desperate, desperate, I tell you, to read, read, read. So I got to do it. I got to go yeah. for Atomic Robo. Makes sense. Kaylee? Uh, Joe, what did you pitch? FBP, Federal Bureau of Physics. Okay, that one. All these science stuff. I am going to vote for Atomic Robo because how could I not? Da, it's it's da, within da, our da, grasp. Da, <laughs> da, 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 da. What did you vote for, Kaylee? Uh, F- FBP. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to vote for uh, Atomic Robo. Nice. Because it's about time. Yeah. About goddamn time. Yeah, I mean, we've only been pitching it for two and a half years. My rule is never to vote for redemption picks unless Kaylee brings them, and then I will vote for them. Yes! Um, yes. So then Kaylee gets credit for what? <laughs> Kaylee's a kill stealer is what's happening here. God no, I don't, it. it just so happens that way. So that means I'm going to have to have a little talk with Kaylee over a couple beers and some tachos about the... The the wonderful world of uh, Federal Bureau of Physics. <laughs> okay, well I'm I'm free now. <laughs> Beers and Tacho sounds great. Yeah. As long as you're buying. Yep. Um, well, you still owe me food, so. Yeah, that's true. I can get you back tomorrow. Anyway, um, bribery aside, uh, yeah, we are reading <laughs> volumes one through three of one Atomic Robo. Atomic Robo. So about thank, time. Yeah, thank you for listening, everybody. <clears throat> thank you for supporting us, and uh, thanks for listening. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Me From The Gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us a nice review. read. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.